my name is Paul Peterson. I'm the CIO for BigML. I handle all the infrastructure. Um, I don't know how I get roped in these talks either, but I'm going to do my absolute best to give you guys a nice presentation. So basically the idea for tonight is I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of some of the algorithms that we've, that we've implemented, how they work, and then I'm actually going to show them to you live. So hopefully you need Wi-Fi. Text. 
All right, and the, the very first thing you do is kind of stem all these words. All right, so great, you know, and greatness are kind of the same words. So it would be greatly or grateful or anything. They're all great. Okay, you stem those down into just that one token, great. And then you take out all these other things that just aren't very useful because they occur so often. You know, be, of, are, have. They occur too often. They're going to be in every single textbook, so they won't give you any predictive power. Likewise, you remove some of these words that don't occur very often. Okay? And then what you're left with is the, the things that make your text interesting. Right? The words that don't occur too often, the words that don't occur uh, too infrequently. And then you basically just make a count. Right? So for this text field, I might make a new feature in my data set that says, great appears four times. And this now becomes a feature that the modeling engine can learn from. Okay? When it sees a new instance with a text field that has great four times, it's a pattern that it can discern that may have meaning. And then you do this, of course, thousands of times. So let's actually run this. And the example I'm going to do is uh, Kaggle's already come up, so I'm, I'm glad to have chosen a Kaggle competition for the demo. Uh, so this is a competition that was hosted by StumbleUpon. And just real briefly, in case you guys haven't seen this, basically what they're providing is a data set with uh, uh, parameterized websites, right? So you've got what kind of website it is, sports or whatever. You've got like number of spelling errors, link ratio, all this kind of ways that you could describe a website, all right, and features. And then you're supposed to build a classifier that tells you whether or not that website is what they call evergreen. Okay, and evergreen, the idea is it has a temporal significance. Okay, so you know, the Wikipedia article on the platypus is still going to be relevant in 10 years, whereas the weather for tomorrow is not. So that's, that's what you're trying to build for a classifier. All right? I did promise I'd go a little slower through the archives, so let me do that on this run. Well, what I'm going to do is direct upload this file. So this, this first part, the interface, the source, this is where you bring your data in. All right? So I'm just direct uploading, but you can also bring files in from S3 buckets, or HTTP links. Uh, we actually have an integration. It's not shown here right now, but you can pull files from Dropbox as well. This allows you to do a nice cloud to cloud transfer to get the data in. Once the data is in, we, we take a quick peek and we try to figure out what all these field types are for you automatically. So you can see, for example, the URL we detected the text field, uh, the URL ID came on as an imager. And then we have this field called the boilerplate. And this, this is actually, well, this is it's actually a structured text, but it has unstructured text in it. So it's a little JSON document that has keys like title and body. All right, and then the value for those keys is the actual title and the entire content of the website. These, these fields are just being hidden. Okay, I've not seen the whole field. This is. So this, this field has the entire content of the website. And then again, we have these categorical fields like what type of website it is, how well that ranking is assigned, um, spelling errors, and so forth. All right, and if you needed to override any of these types, of course, you could do that. So this, the next step is to create a data set. This is actually the first time that we, we scan the entire file, all right? And we basically build this nice summary view for you. So it's just computing histograms. Uh, for any of these categorical fields, you know, you just have a nice distribution. For any of the numeric fields, we'll give you the traditional univariate analysis. So you can get an idea of how your data is distributed there. And then for the text field, we also give you a tag file. And this, what we're showing you here, is over all the instances in the data, okay? This is showing you the relevant frequencies of all the, the tokens that were extracted from those text fields. Okay, so we can see, for example, that the, the token URL was the most prevalent token, which is not too surprising, 716 occurrences, um, you know, followed by, say, recipe with 328, et cetera. All right? Now I'm going to go ahead and just do this one-click model again. And I'll, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the tree uh, and how we compute it. Okay, so the, basically, What's happening here is that it's applying a, uh, it's an integral function, okay, this is basically an information game. All right, so what happens is the algorithm is going to look over all the data, and it's going to try to find the feature in the data and a value, all right, that splits the data into the two most disjoint sets, right? that's roughly the idea, because this is increasing the information game the most, all right, so you're seeking for this one feature that changes the outcome the most, okay? And in this case, that one feature is, in fact, actually the boilerplate, the raw content of the site. And what we learn 
from that feature is that if it contains this token recipe, all right, then we instantly get the prediction of one, which I forgot to tell you, so that would be evergreen. Uh, and we get the confidence there of 86%. And likewise, if we go over to the left, of course, this is uh, the opposite set. This is doesn't contain recipe. And now we have a prediction of zero, but the confidence is just a tad lower. Uh, and in this visualization, of these green <laughs> nodes are like final nodes, okay? So basically what this is telling us is that if your, tech, if your instance, all right, in the boilerplate, it contains recipe and then number 20, then this model is going to predict the, the site, the site that's represent, represented on the data is in fact ever in confidence of 93%, and adding any additional feature will not significantly change the outcome there. All right, that's the final, final prediction, essentially. Okay? I did want to go ahead and show you just one more visualization. This is the second visualization we have from these decision trees called Sunburst. And all that's happening here is that we just took that tree, kind of rotated it, so you're looking down on it. The root node becomes in the center there. And each one of these concentric rings is the split. All right? The arc length is relative to the support. Okay, so this very long arc here, you can see is boilerplate does not contain recipe. All right? And there's 500 inches there, 70% of the base. 70% of the way around the circle there. And the shorter arc is does contain recipe. And this right now is colored by confidence. So all the bright green areas are where the tree is making confident predictions, and the red areas are where it's making less confident predictions. So this gives you a nice high level overview, one quick glance at parts of the tree where it's not it's not uh, creating confident predictions very well, and parts where it's doing quite well. And of course you can zoom in on if some of these are quite small, so we could we could dial in here and kind of get an idea you know, for this set. See a summary of all the features that are bringing us to this node, uh, along with a prediction and a confidence prediction. And we compare it to the one next to it. The only difference is the spelling errors ratio. I don't have any insight to that, but it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, if spelling errors ratio is greater than 08, then we actually are predicting zero of confidence 67, but if it's less than, uh, the, the support's very low, but in one instance, could be noise. Okay. So there it was. That that data set had everything but a date time field in it. I don't have very many of all four, those are a little trickier to find. Um, but how do you know how do we know if this model's any good, right? I mean, I could have just thrown some random thing up there for you. Take my word for it. Boilerplate. It's got a recipe in it, it's great. Uh, so one traditional way to do an evaluation to know whether or not the predictive model is performing well is to start with your data set, okay? And turn it into two new disjoint data sets. So we're gonna build a training set and a test set. And the idea here is that when we build a model, we build it just on the training set, all right? So this model never saw any of those instances. No idea about it, okay? And then we're gonna use this test set and run through the model to create now the thing about the test set is that's labeled data. It's got the known values in it. So we can compare those with the predictions and we can see how well we're doing. Now this is, you know, this, it's statistical. So every time you run this, the results might be slightly different. So you could run this multiple times. But in general, this is a pretty safe way to judge how well this model is doing. It should be at least easy to, easy to tell if you're getting total you know, garbage out of any signal or noise. So I'm going to show you a brief example of that. We'll come back to our original data set here. And you can actually, you can manually split this, but I'm just going to do this with what we call our one click training test, which does an 80 20. And then we we'll come back out to the data set. You can see the three data sets now, right? The original, two new ones, one 80%, one 20%. I'm going to build my model off of the 80%.
All right, so the output of this is we give you these you know, five sort of traditional metrics for a classification problem. The accuracy, this is sort of what you might expect if you're in school, if you're taking a test, you get your score back as your accuracy, all right? And then you have the precision and recall, which are more focused on just the two positives. And then this F measure of five, which is sort of a balanced version of uh, precision and recall. And uh, that's so great, 71%. Uh, what on earth do you do with that? Uh, it sort of depends on what you're trying to do, unfortunately. There's no real great answer. I mean, what is a good accuracy? In fact, there's all kinds of situations where there's something that looks like a great accuracy, but in fact, the model is terrible. Uh, and there's situations where you have terrible accuracy, but in fact, the model is great. Uh, what on earth am I talking about? Okay. So imagine, if you will, that you're doing a fraud detection. Okay. And maybe fraud isn't very prevalent. Let's hope. Uh, so maybe you've got a database that's got 100 instances, 99 of them are not fraud, and just one is fraud. Just one. All right, if I build you a model that just always says not fraud, not fraud, it'll be 99% accurate. Right. But it doesn't do us any good because the thing we're really interested in in that case is the one fraud. Right? We really, really want to find the one fraud. Even if it means we mark a few of the not fraud ones as fraud. Okay? We, don't, we don't mind you know, annoying a few customers, but we don't want to lose that again. All right, so that would be an example where high accuracy doesn't necessarily mean that your model is good. So other ways you can use this, so one, that's like a business case. You have to understand what it is you're trying to predict and what's important to you. All right, that's something you can also get out of the confusion matrix we provide, where you can actually see a breakdown. Let's scroll it back up. So you can actually see a breakdown in this chart of you know, when we predict a zero, when actually is a zero, when actually counts. All right, so if, if the True predictions are more important to you than false predictions. You can actually see the exact breakdown of this tree or of the model. Um, we also provide these two sort of basic metrics to compare against, which are the mode and the random. All right. And the idea here is that the mode is sort of what I was describing before. We just take that biggest class and fill out and say that answer. That would be the mode. So in some cases, it's important that you're doing better than that. You have a nice balanced class like this, or random, or you risk basically just flipping a coin. So you generally like to see that you're doing better than those two. That tells you you're finding some signal in your data that you're actually learning something useful about your data. But of course, the other way that you can use this, once you have an idea of which metric is important to you, is you can now go back and change your model, right? Maybe there's some features in here that aren't important. They're just adding noise to this data set. Uh, maybe there's anomalies in it. You know, there, there could be lots of things wrong with your data set that need to be cleaned up. And then once you return your model, you evaluate it again, and you hope your score is better. So one way that we uh, help you with that is the model summary. And this is actually sort of a nice, a nice feature of trees. All right, so what, what's happening in this model summary, let's scroll it up for you. But, so this is, this is actually what happens is we look over the entire tree, and you find out how much each feature and each node is contributing to reducing the error. Right? So you add a little bit of data, maybe the error goes down, maybe the error goes up. And you add that up over the entire tree, and then you just do a nice weighting for it. And then you, you can see how much each of these features is contributing to reducing the error. Right? So you can see that the boilerplate is extremely strong signal in this data set, uh, followed by the image ratio, and then the rest of these are pretty, pretty low, right? Pretty low. Uh, and some of these may not even be helping. Uh, so you can go back and maybe take a couple of these out, run this again, so it's better. Uh, other situations, maybe maybe you got out of the internet, you had this crazy idea of how to break the stock market, you know, by combining security form fours and something like Quandle. Uh, but maybe you discovered that the stuff you're pulling from the SEC site, uh, could be something else in Australia, I don't know, I'm sorry, uh, is really, really hard to get. Okay, but it's really only adding this little tiny bit of information. So you just stop collecting it. It's not helping anyways. So you can stop doing that. No, no need. Wait, so if we have time, I'm sure. I did want to talk about uh, overfitting. Is there anybody come, uh, familiar with the concept of overfitting already? A couple of hands. Oh, many more. Okay, okay. Um, I'll do a very, very simple demonstration, and then, and then I'll show you on the stumble on. Okay, so basically, the idea, the idea with this overfitting, right, is that we're building this one tree. It's going through the data. It's trying to account for everything's in there to make these splits. Uh, but sometimes you wish it wouldn't, right? Because you want the model to generalize nicely. Uh, it doesn't help you if it's splitting all the time. 
And so we're going to look at an extremely simple uh, example. So here we just have this really tiny data set. It's only a couple instances. And basically all we're doing is we're taking a measurement of a fruit in centimeters and then a label, what kind of fruit it is, right? And so we have this three centimeter plum, four centimeter. These are all plums. And then we have a five centimeter apple. Yeah. So then there's this crazy six centimeter plum sitting here. Okay, and then the really bigger is an apple again. Okay, so we know just looking at this data that this, this plum is an outlier. Alright? I mean, if you're just looking at this, you kind of want your model to say, you know, everything, really five or four below is plum, right? I mean, that's what you'd like to say, everything five and above is an apple. But we'll do that because you have this one weird plum. So it's always ever one big, except you. Alright, so what will happen? So we get a nice branch here. If the diameter is less than four, that's a plum. Okay, so we're looking good so far. If the diameter is greater than six, it's an apple. So what happens when it's less than or equal to six? Uh, we end up with the apple. We got less than five, and greater than five is a plum. Right. So basically, it's overfitting. It's looking at the data and it's putting this last slit in here. We kind of wish it wouldn't have that one. Just like that would go away. Okay. Well, in this particular case, we know that data point. We want it an outlier. We can just take it out, right? This is a really small data set. Okay, imagine you have to imagine you got a gig of data, hundreds of thousands of features, millions of rows. Which ones are anomalous? I'll get to that later. But in, you know, so don't discount the examples because it'd be so easy to remove it. Just one. Okay, so how how can we address this just with a modeling algorithm? So the idea is, let's not build one. Let's not build one tree. Let's build a bunch. Okay. So instead of building one. We'll take a subset of the data and we'll build a tree with that. Uh, but then we've left some data out, but that doesn't seem fair. We've got to include all the data. So we'll do it again. We'll take a different subset and build another tree. A different subset and another tree. And if we keep sampling like that, by and large, we will attribute all the data fairly. Right? But that one outlier won't have made it into every tree. So some of the trees are going to overfit, and some will do what we expect them to do. And then we'll just take a, when we want to make a prediction, we'll make that all the trees predict and combine predictions. So I should just take this same data set. Let's do exactly that. So instead of a single model, we can what's called an ensemble. And what I just described is what we're going to do. Is it's called bagging. Okay, we're just taking random subsets. Um, we do also support random decision forests. Okay, and the difference here is that you, you actually choose the features randomly, each node as well. So before you display it, instead of considering all the features, you just choose a random subset. Uh, that's useful when you have much more complicated, much more wide idea, and more features. This is too small, too small than that. Uh, but of course, you can also choose the number of models. The default is 10. We go from 2 to 1,000 or so. But let's just go ahead and let this run. I didn't mention before, but this is a uh, section of running on our Australian site. All right, so you can actually see just visually, I mean, you can't, it's really dim, but each of those trees looks completely different, right? In fact, that one at the top of it has three notes, so it's kind of interesting. So let's make a prediction with this new ensemble. And every time I run this, I have no idea if it's going to work. So it's kind of exciting. Um, we know that the, the problem area is a six centimeter, right? It's a six centimeter plum. So we'll use this form, we'll just input six centimeters, and we'll see what comes out. I love the prediction. Okay, we can actually see a breakdown of each, each tree voted, right? The first tree voted apple, pretty high confidence. The next one voted plum, extremely low confidence. Okay, next one's apple, plum, plum, apple, apple, plum, apple, plum, plum, plum. But majority wins. It's an apple. Okay, you can change the way the algorithm combines the votes. It's right now just using plurality. Um, there's different ways you can do this. You can also weight it by confidence, for example. So you can give these trees a higher confidence, a little more weight to find an outcome, which is generally useful. Pretty use probability weighted or this K threshold as well. Uh, K threshold is kind of fun. This is useful, like in a fraud case. You could uh, build an ensemble and say, look, I only want to call it not fraud if uh, 9 out of 10 of these trees all agree. It's got to be 90% of the trees. So you can actually constrain the number of trees that have to agree. So nice artificial constraints. All right, so this, so far, 
This has all been supervised learning. It's all predictive analytics. We're taking our data sets that uh, have labeled data, and we're trying to build a model that predicts a known value. <coughs> From the data set that's known. So what's the difference with unsupervised learning? One particular type of unsupervised learning algorithm, which is very low on the screen, sorry, uh, is called clustering. Okay, so the idea here is that in the supervised learning case, you're providing labeled data and you're trying to predict the label, right? In the unsupervised learning, you start with unlabeled data, and your learning task is to sort of make patterns in the data that make points look similar, right? You want to group them all together. That's the idea. And you could, you could so what do you do this for? Well, you know, maybe this is a customer segmentation problem. You know you've got this sort of different customer segments and you know they should be similar and so you can just apply a clustering algorithm and see if you can group them together naturally without the data. Or maybe you want to do a supervised learning problem but you don't have labeled data. So you cluster it first and find all the things that look really similar. Okay, and then you sample from those clusters and try to figure out what they are, label them that way. Okay, so that rather than trying to label every single instance, which could be relative to an enormous data set. So So this is just like an iris data set, right? So we don't have to label anymore. All we're going to do is try to combine these combined patterns. How does this work? <coughs> so if I if I gave you this really simple graph and I said uh, make these three clusters, right? Humans are pretty good at this. You probably go, well, this, these are all really the same, and they're all the same. Those are pretty similar too. Okay. So this clustering algorithm that we're using is, it basically does it tries to do exactly that, except that it does it in multiple dimensions. It's just a two dimensions, a very simple problem. And the way it does this is it, you tell it, look, I want it, I want two clusters, okay? And it sort of just chooses three points randomly. So take them all in place and then it computes the distance. So it looks at how far away the point it shows from all the other ones. Okay? And then it uses a little algorithm to move them a little closer, a little closer. So they all distribute nicely around there. Okay, what you end up with, that's what we want. What you end up with is these central ones. So for each one of these clusters, you end up with a point that's sort of at the center, right? That's what we want to see. All right. So to do this, I am going to do the different data sets. I'll pull this one from S3. So I want to bring this distillery along, but I don't want it to affect the clustering algorithm, so I'm going to add it as what we call a summary field. There we go. Um, and as you can see, we can choose the number of clusters. And while we're at it, I'm going to go ahead and highlight this little option here, which I'll, I'll explain. So basically, this, this is going to create some additional models from this cluster, which is sort of an interesting thing to do. And rather than eight, let's go with Number if I remember on this data set. 
All right, so now this, is, this visualization, each one of these little balls here actually represents the, each one of the clusters we found, 10 clusters, uh, the ones uh, way out there. And uh, the size is relative to the number of instances that are in each one. Okay, so this one that's in the center has uh, 14 instances in it, it's made in cluster four. And over here, this is the information regarding the centroid. Okay, so you know, that cluster, all those points are distributed around the centroid, this is, this is the middle of the centroid. And you can see the characteristics And you get a histogram that shows you how far away all the points in that cluster are from that center. So they're uh, pretty flat in the cluster, which is very interesting. Uh, well, we don't have very many instances, so they're all going to be pretty flat. All right? So we could actually make a data set from any one of these. So if I wanted to you know, experiment with cluster four a little more closely, I could actually uh, freeze the visualization there, click the button. And now this data set just has the instances we're in cluster four. And I can start playing with this data. I get, for example, just looking at the histogram, you know, you can see the body is ranging from one to three, right, so kind of the middle body, et cetera. But what if we wanted to ask the question of, you know, what is it that really makes one of these clusters different from all the others? Right. And I'm just going to pick one randomly. Uh, we'll go cluster four. So what is it that makes cluster four different than the other seven or nine clusters? What we can do is we can build a model. Right, we can now take these instances and label them. We'll give these ones a label of cluster 4. And we'll give all the other instances a label of not cluster 4. And then we'll build a model to try to predict which instances are in cluster 4 and which are not. And that model is, remember, going to be making decisions based on the features, the values in the data. So we'll be able to get a sense of the characteristics of cluster 4 from that model. Let's go ahead and let that model run. All right, so we get oh, we have a nice node right there. Okay, so if three is less or equal to one, it is not cluster four. So we know right away that cluster four are these things that are typically more three. Right. Uh, likewise, here's another characteristic for this particular cluster. You know, three greater than one, two is greater than two, and we'll factor of zero. That's what it says. That particular set of features, no tobacco. Okay. Other types of unsupervised learning. Anomaly detection. And, um, well, let me come back to that. So these are both unsupervised learning algorithms. They both start with unlabeled data. Where the learning task here is to group these by similarity, the learning task here is to try to find the dissimilar ones. Right? You want to look at each, sort of like you're looking at each point by itself and saying, how much like all the rest of the data set are you? And give it a score. All right? So this sort of a complementary task, if you will. Okay, so how does this work? This is, we're using something called an isolation forest. Uh, this is actually an algorithm we've implemented based on research that was done at uh, Monash University. But the basic idea is you uh, grow a random decision tree until <coughs> each instance is in its own leaf. Right, so you just, just grow this tree randomly. So you separate the data as much as you can. Okay. The points that are way down here, it took lots of decisions to separate. So those are hard to get by themselves, hard to isolate. Okay. The points that are way up here, it only took two features, and then it was off by itself. Those are easy to isolate, right? So the ones that are easy to isolate, those are probably anomalous. Now, there's one or two features that make them really different, stand out. But that's not quite good enough when you just build one tree. So in typical statistics fashion, uh, we'll do it a bunch, okay? And each time we do it, we'll note the depth of the instance. We'll find where, where it came up. And then average that all together, all right? And take that distance average and combine it all into a nice score, zero meaning normal and one meaning completely anomalous. So let me go ahead and give you an example. So for this example, I'm going to use the uh, uh, 
we use this diabetes data set. It's actually a fairly well-known data set on UCI. Um, it's a data set of uh, diabetes Data set measure, diagnostic measurements, so we have like pregnancy, plasma, glucose, blood pressure, and all these things that are very easy to measure. And then a doctor that you know, made a final determination whether that patient had diabetes. Okay. And if you were doing like a supervisor and we're trying to model this, you might, you might be asking a question, you know, can we predict diabetes from these very simple measurements? That would be, that would be a learning task you might use this data for. Uh, but before we try to do that, we're just going to see, are there any points in this data set that stand out? Do you think it's anomalous? So remember what's happening right now in the background. By default, we build uh, 128 trees. So it's going to do this process 120 times, combine all the results. And then by default, we'll show you this top 10 anomalous points. Right? And in the UI, we, we show you the anomalous score 0 to 1 as a percentage. So that's a 0.642 points over there. Uh, we, we find in our experience that anything over like 0.6 is usually quite anomalous. So that, that data point is really kind of standing out in this data set. And why is that? Well, on the right hand side over here, these are the, the actual values. Oh, sorry. These are the actual values for that particular data point, and then the distribution of the values for that particular feature. So we see this data point has a diabetes pedigree of 2.3, which is a sort of the far end of this. Yeah, that's probably that's never a good sign if you want your point to be really normal. Uh, similar to the insulin, 7.4, it's still way out here, the far end of this again. All right, and the uh, plasma glucose, 197, again, way out on the tail end of this distribution. And then this fourth feature here, we have this, the diabetes field, right? And you know, it's, it sort of matches our intuition if you have a lot of the history of diabetes in your family, you have high insulin, you have high glucose. These are strong indicators for diabetes. And yet this patient is in fact false. All right, and that, that is very likely what is making this data point stand out as an anomaly in this data set. You've got a strong signal for one outcome. Yeah, it's labeled different. Now, there could be lots of reasons for this too. That person could really be it. Maybe somebody made a mistake entering this data. All right, but if you were starting to analyze this data, you might look at that data point and go, all right, where did we collect that one? We're going to check the form, make sure that's right. Okay, that's a little screen. Um, in this particular data set, if you take it out, then build a single tree, the performance when you evaluate it goes up, uh, depending on the split, by nearly a percentage point, just by removing those top two points there. 760 and so on. And I, I can actually show you that. We go very quickly. In order to run evaluation, I need to do one quick training test split again. Go ahead and create an anomaly on this training set. I want to make the data set and take those anomalous points out. Hopefully I get a good split. Top two ones out. So I'll just highlight them here. Put this new button, create a new data set. And all, all I did is I just took those two out. So this new data set is cleansed of those anomalies. Let's go ahead and make our model. While that's running, I'll come back to the training set. Same training set, but this time I'll just one click model without removing the anomalies. We'll value this one. And back to the other model. This one.
So other things you can use the anomaly detector for. So there's this idea of covariate shift. All right, so you train your model, and you collect data, and then you do it for six months, you train your model, and now you're happy, it's doing great, you start making predictions with it, and um, you suddenly find out your model is not doing, doing well. Uh, you're scratching your It's wrong with my model, okay? Uh, and basically, the problem is that the data you trained it on has a certain distribution, right? Maybe it's people at a certain age, maybe you had time data, and it was all for the spring or something. And the distribution of the data you're predicting with is completely different. Right? I mean, all your data was from spring, and you're making predictions from summer. Okay, so your model sort of lost its relevance. Okay? The distribution is shifting. So one way you can use an anomaly detector is you kind of use it in parallel with your model. Right, so you build your model, you build your anomaly detector at the same time. Now every time before you make a prediction, you run it through the anomaly detector. Okay? And if it tells you the point you want, the data you want to predict from is anomalous from the training data, then you sort of have this idea of whether or not your model will have any competence. All right? and it's no guarantee, but it's at least a strong indicator. If it comes back and says that data is completely normal, you know it matches your training data, and your model is more than likely competent. Of course, there are other ways to solve this problem well, but this is a nice, easy one to do in parallel from your training set. All right, so I'm going to stop here. If, if you guys ever needed an excuse to go to Spain, <laughs> there you go.